Apologies, Rivers of Flesh and As If Women Matter, in addition to all the other writing that she does. Uh, so I think I will uh, let Ruchira take over from here uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, play this as Ruchira wants. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you to Adri for inviting me and to Shoibal Da who gave me an opportunity to be here when Professor Ghosh was being felicitated yesterday. It was a very precious moment and I'm glad that I was able to reorganize my program to not speak at the Villanova University where I should have been speaking yesterday to be here with all of you in Patna today. Because Patna matters more to me uh, than um, many other places in the world and I requested the organizers of the university where I was supposed to go and speak yesterday if I could send them a Skype, uh, a taped uh, presentation, which they did. Um, I wanted to, I know all of you are mostly econ economists and uh, I wanted to excuse uh, any of the mistakes I make when I make my presentation um, and pick up the useful things from what I'm about to say. As uh, Gopa mentioned, I'm a feminist campaigner and uh, for 30 long years I have been trying to bring to the fore of the issue of women because I feel that they are one of the most neglected uh, individuals in our society, in our world. As we think about development very often uh, in Bihar, we think about caste. Uh, in many places of the world, class, of course, is something we talk about, but we have often neglected gender. And today I'm here to talk to you about the fact that unless gender is interlinked with uprooting the inequality of caste and class, we will not be able to uproot inequality at all. Because after all, gender digs a dread trench into our brain into which all other inequalities fall. What do I mean by that? We understand and accept inequality first at home, where we are born and where we are raised. Because that's where we first see that it's all right for one group of human beings to order and one group to obey. One group of human beings to get praised for their work and to be paid for their work, whereas another group of human beings neither to be paid for their work and not to be praised for the work because it is considered normal. It is also we watch and see that uh, one group of human being automatically understands that they can take any actions or decisions that they want to, whereas the other group of human being is constantly seeking approval. And that's when we learn that inequality exists. And then when we step out of the home, we begin to accept other inequalities. So unless we actually tackle this most fundamental of inequalities, it is going to be very difficult for us to take on caste or class. After all, caste, is also reproduced because of gender. What do I mean by that? You need gender, you need to control production and reproduction by controlling the bodies of women. Without controlling the bodies of women, we cannot reproduce caste. Because women are the vessels who will either produce cheap labor or be cheap labor themselves. Either we will be put on a pedestal to produce male heirs or we will be asked to be even sold into prostitution or sold into child marriage to produce cheap labor. So caste cannot be reproduced without gender inequality. And so I'm here today to think, talk to you because I know this is a conference about uh, social indicators and uh, I have been working, I'll tell you a little bit about my own journey that what are the social indicators that I've come to talk to you about? I have come to talk to you on behalf of the last girl. What do I mean by the last girl? I mean that 13 year old in a brothel. That girl, I want you all to shut your eyes for a second and think about who that 13 year old is. She's poor, she's female, she's low caste, and she's a teenager. In the United States or in America or in Europe, she could be a religious minority, she could be a refugee, she could be black, she could be Native American, First Nation. The last girl is correlational. 
which exists everywhere. And because of these intersectional and intertwining inequalities, she is the most vulnerable of human beings, and she cannot take any decision for herself about her future, her daily life, or even her body. She cannot decide whether to go to school or to stay at home to help with the chores. She cannot decide even if she's going to stay at home to help with the chores or be sold into domestic servitude, prostitution, child marriage. She cannot decide what she will eat, when she will eat. She cannot decide what she will wear. She cannot even decide who she will marry or when she will have a baby. This girl exists everywhere. And this is the girl we have to think about when we develop policies. Kamla Devi Chautopadhyay once said that change must begin at the bottom and transform the top. But what has happened is that we cannot imagine about change from the bottom because we cannot imagine the last. We don't know who this 13-year-old in a brothel is. So very often the policies, the interventions that we develop are not for the last. We end up skimming the top of the bottom. And I will give you examples about that. The first example is India's massive AIDS control program all through the 1990s. More than $500 million was spent on it. The National AIDS Control Organization was created for it. The Ministry of Health was given part of this money. The Public Health Foundation was set up to validate the data created through these programs. McKinsey was hired to develop the design of the program. Uh, the Gates Foundation was set up in India to help India control AIDS for that. UN AIDS was funded for it. And what happened when an organization like McKinsey was hired to help India prevent AIDS, to design our program? Most of them are marketing professionals and they decided to focus on a product. The product was a condom. And they decided that the entire AIDS control program would be based on condom distribution. And how was the condom to be distributed? To whom? How? Where? The condom was to be distributed, McKinsey decided, in the red light districts of India. Because they said, that the highest number of sexual transactions in India happen in the brothels and the red light districts of India. A magnificent design was set up for that. National AIDS Control Program, uh, NACO, was given money to set up the state AIDS control societies, which in turn would then give money to frontline NGOs to distribute condoms. 23 intermediary organizations were given money, like Population Services International, CARE, uh, also to do the same. They in turn gave money to 126 NGOs all over the country to do the same thing. UNAIDS also ended up doing the same thing because they all worked together in collaboration and the Public Health Foundation and UNAIDS were also to validate the data as this program was unfolding to talk about impact. And targets were set, that so many condoms have to be distributed in this district, so many condoms have to be distributed in that state. All the frontline social workers actually began to make Excel spreadsheets, and their outcome and output became the same, the number of condoms distributed. Nobody knew whether people were using the condoms or not. And on top of that, Organizations like the Population Services of India created marketing campaigns which mention that uh, it doesn't matter which sex worker you choose, choose the right condom. The outcome of that was that uh, they created a false notion of ethical demand. Where it became alright to buy sex if you used a condom. The other horrible outcome of that was, of this entire program, was that many NGOs, frontline workers, state aids, controlled societies, began to hire pimps and brothel keepers for ease of access inside the brothels. So if an NGO like mine, Apneya Women Worldwide, which I founded, 
would think about going and complaining to a police station and saying that this 19-year-old or this 20-year-old is being held hostage in such and such brothel in Calcutta in Sonagachi and she wants to get out, can you help her? And such and such pimp or brothel keeper is holding her hostage. We were told by the police officer this is NGO rivalry and that pimp or brothel keeper is actually a peer educator for either the status control organization or for the rival NGO. All of this led to the most devastating outcome in India. It led to the increase of the sex industry by 17 times. More brothels mushroomed, more demand was created, there were more customers who wanted to buy, uh, buy girls. The entire program actually began and designed to protect male buyers from disease rather than the women and girls from the male buyers. Gender was thrown out of the window. Everybody, because the amount was so huge, more than $500 million, everybody in India who did any kind of public health work became a consultant, an employee, a policy advisor to this program. And it became really, really hard to undo it. In my own capacity as someone heading an NGO which worked in the red light districts, I went to meet the head of the National AIDS Control Organization to tell her about what was going on. That because the sex industry had become more entrenched and legitimate because of this program, uh, the red light areas were growing, they were expanding, brothels were mushrooming, and more women and girls were being brought in. There are enough poor girls all over India for the traffickers to prey upon. It became a magnet both for the buyers and for the traffickers. So the head of the National AIDS Control Organization at that time told me, Ruchira, you can think about the big picture, but if brothels do not exist, where will we distribute the condoms? And so the indicator of the number of condoms began to drive the program. Rather than the memory of why the entire AIDS control program was at all set up. This 13 year old girl in the brothel that I asked you all to imagine, she did not even have the ability to negotiate condom usage. She, cannot, she could not say no to an unwanted customer, let alone to a custom unprotected sex. So in any case, the girls and women in the red light districts of India kept getting AIDS because some customers would use a condom and some would not. There is still no evidence to prove the success of the AIDS control program. But the pity of it is that so many vested interests have been created uh, with so much money being flushed into the country to do this that condom manufacturers now have joined hands with many of the condom distributors to promote the legalizing of pimping and brothel keeping in our country. And they have actually issued reports all over the world globally in collaboration with UNAIDS, etc., asking for the pimping of uh, legalizing of pimping and brothel keeping. This goes back to the 19th century as well, to British colonialism, where once syphilis broke out in the British Empire. And the British officials wanted to be able to provide disease-free women to those in service of the British Empire, the clerks and the soldiers, but also protect them from getting disease. They passed the Contagious Diseases Act, under which brothels were given license if they periodically took women and girls to the municipal authorities for periodic health checkups. And that is why if you go to Sonagachi or Kamkipura, which none of you ever will, but if you ever see videos or movies, you will see that some of the brothels have numbers outside them with red bulbs shining above them, saying, Welcome House 67, Welcome House 23. Those red bulbs are the reason why a brothel area is called a red light district. So soldiers and clerks would know they could find disease-free women in these brothels. In independent India, we have revisited the same thing and thrown women and girls under the bus. 
because it has also led to increased commodification on women and, of women and girls. They failed to imagine the 13-year-old. I did go to one of the big donors of this program and speak to them, and luckily they have course corrected and they are no longer funding this program. But the damage is going to take generations to undo. Because they did not think about the 13-year-old. She did not need a condom. She needed first food, then she needed clothing, then she needed shelter, safe and independent housing. When I talk about shelter, I'm not talking about a shelter home. She needed safe and independent housing. Then she needed education. And then the eighth or the ninth thing could be that she might have wanted her customer to use a condom if she ended up in a brothel. But the money began to be diverted to the purchase and distribution of condoms. The very money which could have been used for her education. And if she had been put in to a school, then maybe the impact of the AIDS intervention would have been higher. I can list other examples of the failure of impact when we fail to think of the last girl. The failure of impact is also when we think about um, child lines. Child lines are helplines, which are phone lines where girls or children who are in danger can call in. People who have designed this program do not understand and cannot empathize with the fact that this girl or this woman who is inside a red light district in a brothel does not have access to a phone. Huh. Even if she had access to a phone, she would not know how to make the call to the child line and what she should ask for. Because she doesn't have the education to know that her right is not to be owned by anybody. The same thing with microcredit. While microcredit works for those who have the ability, a skill, some land, some money to be able to repay the loan, it actually, all of you know here, and I don't have to talk about the 75,000 farmers who have committed suicide, it doesn't work for those who cannot repay the loan. It pushes them deeper into poverty. There's another horrific example, and the list goes on and on. Dependence on a product. What does it do? Big Pharma is moving into India. All of you must have read two days ago that foreign direct investment is going to be allowed in pharma pharmaceuticals. They're going to be promoting their products. When they promote products, they also at the same time insist on the closure of the health systems. When the health systems close down, then integrated health does not exist. All this, all these examples that I'm, that I'm quoting to you, why have these things been chosen? Why are products being chosen over investment in people? The reason is that the framework that McKinsey has developed is called SMART. Specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound. When we have to choose something specific, very often, we don't go for something which is holistic. We already narrow down what we have to do. Whereas a human being who we need to develop in, the last person, needs holistic wraparound services. We cannot have focus on one thing versus another. The other part of SMART is measurable. When we talk about measurable, we often, as the Chief Minister said yesterday, and the head of UNICEF, we often ignore what is qualitative or experienced. Achievable. It often makes us ignore the idea of idealistic, to do something where the need is the greatest. Instead of that, we go for the low-hanging fruit. 
And because we go for the low-hanging fruit, we often don't weed out the problem from its roots. And the problem keeps repeating itself, and we keep doing first aid. Results-oriented. So we choose something through which we can get quick results, like condom distribution, but we forget the larger goal of ending AIDS. Time-bound. Again, we have to do things which can be done in a year or two, whereas human change takes years and generations. So we forget the sustainability of the program. And so that is why it is very important for us to actually think of a new framework, which is holistic, experienced, idealistic, goal-oriented and sustainable, instead of smart. Gandhiji would have never launched the Quit India movement if he had actually thought about something which should be specific and measurable and achievable and results-oriented and time-bound. He did it because he was idealistic. He did it for the greater good. And I want to end my presentation by mentioning to you an anecdote of Gandhiji. A British reporter once asked him, Mr. Gandhi, why do you always travel third class? And he said, because there is no fourth class. So for all of you who are developing indicators, and I have great hope because only from Bihar can this happen, a four-day conference on social indicators, challenging something which the world is trying to figure out why we are where we are. And the UN is course correcting from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. Only from Bihar can this conference happen because you are closer to the last. And there are people here who are social scientists, political scientists, economists, who grapple with the last as an ethical commitment. And so think about Gandhiji and think about why we always travel third class. Thank you. Uh, so we can uh, open this up to discussion, Q&A. Uh, Comments could be brief, but do you want people to identify Yes. Okay, so please identify yourself when you ask a question or make a comment, and then I will let, uh, if there's too many hands, then I will pick and choose, otherwise we can just keep going as we are. No, I think we all agree that it was a, an eye-opener for those of us who may not be actually, uh, you know, who, who've grown up seeing the NAC poster on every bus and every uh, wall, uh, but may not have actually spent time to think about what exact, how, how an entire campaign got uh, focused on just one product and not on uh, the process or whatever, whatever, what it was trying to achieve. And I think. Uh, in a conference like the one where we are right now, uh, this is, uh, I think this has been part of the theme that has been looked at since yesterday, is how numbers can be made to tell varying stories. And uh, so much of the story could also be about the spin that we put on the numbers and the questions we ask and the ones we choose not to ask. Uh, so I, uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you first for making the time to come in here and to Shoibal for uh, as he is, uh, which is why uh, we all uh, support Adri for being able to uh, bring in this dimension into a conference that could otherwise become uh, just a conference on uh, various economic or other indicators and uh, we may not get a chance to look at uh, uh, other uh, uh, aspects of where else uh, social uh, Statistics can count. Uh, are you? Are we saying that we will put a? We'll set a mic around the room. No, I would like. Oh, you want to ask a question? Sure. <laughs> uh, thank you. You can keep sitting. Uh, yeah. You can relax. Yeah. So, thank you so much. And I think the reasons maybe why there uh, are no any questions is basically because I think everybody very much agrees with what you are saying. Now. While everybody might agree, it was also a very good example of uh, misusing of statistics, I think. And uh, I think that is a very 
important issue which, uh, which we have slightly discussed yesterday, but um, like in this case, like everybody now can show in the case of condoms that we are using so many condoms and that's really going on. But that's so it's very good example that the statistics can be, which are meant actually for a very good purpose, but can be misused. So one should be very much aware of that. But going further to your proposition uh, that we should look at the last bill, uh, but you have indicated that this also is very much not only uh, to the Indian government, it's very much not only international governments are involved, but NGOs all over the world. So, I, if you want to say it practically, I mean, like this girl you are mentioning, to reach this girl um, also will be needing a lot of um, reform in how things are going in the rest of the world. So that that is, I think. Did you think about that? Did you have any, do you have any kind of like? Would like you to say something about that? Okay. Yes, I think what we need is really a restoration of systems, because products are of course necessary. Uh, so I don't want to say we don't need products, but products have to be the outcome of a system, because when the system fails to reach the last girl. Uh, then you know the product is going to only do that much help and sometimes it may even end up uh, causing and entrenching the harm if we go for harm reduction models instead of harm eradication models if we think about the last girl. Um, for example, uh, in India, you know, uh, the whole idea of India actually, uh, you know, is was to go to the last and uh, one of the examples that I've been thinking about very often uh, recently and it's not about the last girl is our election commission, you know, just looking at the numbers of people who line up to vote in India is because India includes every last person as much as possible into the system of casting a ballot. So I met this polling officer who says that he would actually, actually go to the sidewalk to look for a pavement dweller to see if he could include a pavement dweller on our electoral rolls. And that was how India was set up then we would go to the pavement dweller and put him on the roads and just see where he was sleeping if he said he was a pavement dweller. So this whole system was to include, not to exclude. Whereas in America, as you know, one third of black American youth have been disenfranchised from voting. And they are now facing that problem because it's leading to the kind of electoral outcomes that they don't know how to deal with anymore. Yes, sir. Here, then, next. My name is Abdulim. Um, I wanted to get back to your point on whether statistics tell the whole story or not. Um, as somebody who's been working in international organizations for quite some time, I feel that there is, um, you know, in an effort to be objective, you tend to miss the 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 personal link to stories. Um, and I, su I suspect maybe there has to be a male or female bias in this because it seems that males like more of the objective story and numbers rather than the essence of the story That's itself. But I do feel that um, I, const I constantly struggle with this issue about low hanging fruits and the high hanging fruits. And we are constantly told to go for the low hanging fruits yeah. because you are supposed to deliver and you are supposed to be monitored and you are supposed to be delivering something. Uh, but in that, in that process we lose the essence of the story. And I have constantly tried to use statistics to build stories. To say, you can get the depth of a story through numbers, but it has been re a, a very, very intense struggle within international organizations to tell the real story through numbers. And I wonder if we want to really focus also on qualitative part of the, of the research, which we don't really usually do. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we'll, I, I'll allow you to come in, so we'll collect a couple of comments and then, yeah, okay, so you're next, first that lady and then you're back next. Yeah. Um, will I have a mic? Yeah, the mic is supposed to come, yeah. Hello? 
am Varna Kangli, uh, assistant professor in RB. Uh, rather, I have an inquisitiveness about something. Uh, many times in news, we see that the restaurant or hotel is raided and many of the girls are caught and they are taken to rehabilitation centers or somewhere. So, what happens to them after that? Are they really sent to their home or school? This is, I just wanted to know. Or uh, after we are, uh, and they just end up in the rehabilitation center only. So what happens to them after that? So normally, uh, you know, what happens is that uh, girls, uh, till they are 18, are kept in the rehabilitation center. And then suddenly when they turn 18, they're supposed to fend for themselves. And it's a very difficult thing for them because uh, the circumstances at home are still the same, where they were actually, uh, you know, picked up from by traffickers. So uh, without skills, without capital uh, to start a small business, without housing, without education, it's very hard for them to begin a new life. On top of that, because they've been in a brothel, you know, they face the, st they face the stigma of being sexually used and they're told nobody will marry them, etc. So the other issue then becomes is that how do they do it? Which is why investment in uh, school, in housing, in livelihood programs is equally important as investment in her being in a shelter. The other issue is that in India uh, now, uh, you know, we have multiple laws dealing with uh, victims of prostitution, trafficking, child labor, and all of that. So the girl herself doesn't even know what the laws are or what she can avail of. It's so many, it's written in archaic English and all of that. So that's another issue that we face, that the last girl cannot understand the law, which is for her and on her behalf. But also uh, the other thing is that there's one law which is based on the Contagious Diseases Act, the British Contagious Diseases Act. It's called ITPA, Immoral Traffic Prevention Act. And that is still on the books. So first of all, the word immoral makes her sound as if you know she has done something um, which is not moral and you know she's really a victim of circumstances. So we have been lobbying for the word immoral to be removed. But also in that law, there's a section eight which is uh, that a girl or a woman can be put through the criminal justice system uh, for soliciting in a public place and very often the police tend to use that section of the law because you know they love to uh, round up the women put them into a police station collect half the collect some bribes and let them out and because of that the woman gets criminalized and that criminality then also tends to affect what she can do not do what she thinks about herself what her family thinks of her all of that, also whether she can go for protection to the law. She begins to fear the police rather than thinking of the police protecting her. And I think you were also ta talking about the fact that uh, prostitution really is absence of choice. And uh, you know, if there are no other options, what's it, what is she going to do? I think that was your bigger question, that what happens after the shelter? Because nothing changes outside. So, uh, you know, the thing is we have to increase choices for last girls and women, which means investment in the welfare state. And the problem now is that the welfare state itself is being dismantled. Um, so for example, midday meals are being cut, uh, you know, for women and children. Um, budgets for education, Salva Shiksha Abhiyan, have been cut for poor girls and all of that. And that is also having an impact on trafficking. Exam for example, from Jharkhand, uh, the KGBV schools under Salva Shiksha Abhiyan, were closed and it led to an increase in trafficking of tribal girls from Jharkhand. So these are also issues that we have to think about, that, you know, how do we increase choices? Okay, so, uh, you first and then, it's three ladies in a row, one and two and three, okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta. It was very revealing presentation. Um, I would like to make a very small comment, saying that, um, since so far the social issues are not really dealing from the... Yes, I'm Rakhi Bhattacharya from JNU. Uh, just a small comment, you know. Uh, I was just wondering that since um, such social issues are not yet dealing properly from the market strategy of our new neoliberal uh, development model so far, so that is how we see that the institute like McKinsey, you know, comes up with the concept called SMART, which is really measurable. 
in terms of capturing these data, these issues, you know. So I was also wondering that do you think that this kind of um, conventional terms like statistics would be relevant to capture the issues of social sector in India or across the world, you know? Uh, or we should think of more like strategic gender needs, which, uh, which will capture broadly in many other qualitative aspects of these issues, you know. And lastly, I just wanted to know whether you have come up with any kind of report on this study, you know, is it available in your website? Thank you. Yes, there have been several reports by many organizations. There have been several reports by many organizations globally. Uh, some of them have been co commissioned by the government of Sweden, Norway, France, which just gave me this uh, honor. Uh, and I can, uh, they are on my website and on other websites also. Uh, in fact, uh, there are countries now which are actually creating different frameworks to deal with the issue of trafficking. And we've begun to call it the Nordic model. And uh, because uh, it's as usual, the Scandinavian countries which have taken the first step to make a more gender um, friendly laws. And uh, Sweden was the first country to do so. Uh, the second was Norway. Norway studied the difference between the approach that uh, Netherlands had with the approach that uh, Sweden had in reducing trafficking. And they chose the Swedish model. Now, what is that model? The model basically decriminalizes the women because they say that women are trafficked or in prostitution or in situations of domestic servitude and other kinds of uh, forced labor because of their absence of choices, because of the inequality which is also gender. And uh, they have criminalized the traffickers and penalized the jobs. So the way they have written their laws, their laws are only two paragraph long. And so that a girl who's a victim of trafficking can also understand it. And the law says, that the selling of sex is not illegal, the purchase of sex is illegal. So they have shifted the blame from the victim to the perpetrator and trafficking has come down in Sweden. So therefore when Norway was thinking of its law, it compared Holland and uh, Sweden and went for uh, the Swedish model and uh, so that's there. Uh, Holland also is now thinking of revising its own law because they also see that trafficking has increased to their country. Uh, France was the latest which passed the law and I'd gone to the French assembly and spoken uh, about the model which we should have, which is why uh, France gave me this honor. And I had suggested this in Sweden and uh, Norway too. The United States has done it half where uh, they have uh, shifted the blame from the victim to the perpetrator by punishing the demand for uh, traffic, uh, for trafficking. Uh, but they haven't gone far enough to punish the customer who they call Johns, uh, because you know very many influential people are involved in that. Uh, but uh, they have at least gone up to punishing the trafficker, and there are some states inside the United States uh, which have also punished uh, Johns. And that has freed up women to come and testify and uh, speak up. At the same time, all these laws have gone along with an increased investment in girls and women who are at risk to being trafficked or are in prostitution. So it's not like you know abandoning them. But the investment is not just in shelters. It's a much more holistic approach where the investment is in education, job training, uh, uh, loans to start small businesses. Also in America, there's something called the T visa. So a woman who's trafficked from a different country is allowed to stay on in America and get housing support and health support as well. Uh, hi, Ruchira. I want to just uh, pick up this idea of the last girl a little more. And um, I think you, you sort of foreshadowed my question in your response to uh, one of the earlier uh, comments. You know, there are lots of last girls, right? I mean, in a country where child-sex ratio is so female adverse in several pockets, um, where sex determination happens, where female malnutrition is much stronger. Yesterday we saw under five mortality is much higher among girls than among boys. Um, you know, I, I love this idea of the last girl. Um, and I, I wonder if I can ask you to reflect a little more on who are these four or five, or I don't know, not to categorize them, but I think, I think if we were to think of where we want to push governments to think, to act, as well as generate information, I mean, some of this does need statistics, and some of this simply because 
I mean, of course, it doesn't necessarily set the agenda, but it's important in pushing an agenda, that, right? So I, I wonder if I could ask you to reflect on what are those, you know, what do you see today that are, you know, who are these last girls that we should be sort of thinking about both for Bihar, but also much nationally, I mean, Jharkhand is and internationally. Girls Not Brides, I mean, there's several of these campaigns, but they're quite siloed, and I agree um, with you that, you know, in some ways, we get very programmatically um, programmed, and, you know, and I just wonder if you can also push our thinking, uh, especially nationally for me, would be my interest, but where are these pockets and what are the sorts of issues that you see are critical for the next 10 years that we should be also pushing statistics on? You know, I'm also exploring it, so you know, my answer cannot be the complete answer. We have to come up with this answer through a process of consultations and uh, you know, I mean, uh, consultations with UNICEF in New York, so we are grappling with this because we know that the MDGs failed and we are moving to SDG, so we have an opportunity now and, uh, you know, she's correlational because she can't, she's not static and she's different in different places. I've also talked to Dr. Amartya Sen about it because he did a kind of book on India called Country of First Boys. So I was telling him I want to do a book called No Country for the Last Girl. Because everywhere she's left out or she's invisible. And uh, you know, through a process of consultations, we will have to identify who this last girl is. And uh, in India, of course, you know, the first four indicators, I can tell you she's poor, female, low caste, and a teenager, which is very broad. And then inside that, uh, you know, hunger. I see hunger being one of the big issues in India uh, for the next 10 years. You know, and this is a country which actually got out of the Bengal family and we've never had uh, you know, famine again and now we are creating a system which can lead to something um, devastating for us. So I think hunger is a very big issue uh, for the last girl. Um, housing is a very big issue for the last girl. Uh, education, uh, you know, there are, but I think we have to do this through a process of consultation. So I don't want to give you um, Glib answer, Yanini, because we've been talking about these issues for now 10 years, I think, you and I. So it'll be, we have to continue this discussion. And maybe we should do a consultation on this then. Just think. Yeah, um, yeah thanks, uh, Ruchira. Um, two quick comments. One about numbers. I think rather than, uh, and it's very common, uh, whenever the issue of gender or uh, uh, any kind of inequality is raised, the whole issue of quantitative versus qualitative comes. And I think that's kind of an artificial uh, divide. Rather than that, what we need to, I mean, and then we know that these are complementary and both are important. I think one big problem that one faces is what kind of numbers we collect and how do we read. I think reading of numbers, the perspective that we need, that's very key. And that's why a lot of issues remain uh, uh, undiscussed, especially when it comes to the perspective of gender or the forms of inequality. So that's an area that one perhaps needs to work on. Uh, uh, there is this whole issue of products. I think mean, now it's too pernicious, too deeply entrenched. Any issue, the solution is product waste. I mean, one, one area where I kind of work uh, uh, a lot is education. And the whole issue of quality, again, the numbers, what kind of numbers you need has been reduced to a particular form of indicator of quality. And the solution comes in all kinds of quick fixes, much, very much like uh, industry where components are brought in and then you feel that that will lead to a solution. So it's, it's very deep, it's very uh, uh, kind of widespread and not easy to break that. Health, it's the same story. Yeah. Can you identify yourself? Uh, I'm uh, uh, Jyotsna. I work with the um, Center for Budget and Policy Studies in Bangalore. And you know, there were two more examples I was thinking of Jyotsna when uh, you were talking, you know, about this product-based solutions. Uh, recently in the field of education, uh, you know, uh, there's a big drive to just put in TV screens into slums, you know, and uh, expect children to learn on their own by watching a TV screen. Now again, if you think of the last girl, you know, and she's living in a slum, it's not just quantity and quality, it's also a failure of imagination to imagine the last. It's even beyond the subaltern, right? It's the utterly destitute that we are thinking about. Why would there be electricity in the slum? And a, a first generation learner, how can they learn on their own through a TV screen? Uh, for our own children, we want the best of teachers. We, want, we guide them constantly. 
So again, replacing human teachers with a TV screen, you know, who's going to make money? The person manufacturing the TV screens, the internet uh, suppliers, you know, through which we will beam down programs. It's, it's just so unfortunate. Uh, and we will replace skills with thinking in the long run also with all of this which is going on. So, you know, it's going beyond everything. The other thing is like, for example, t talking about a top-down solution, um, you know, one of the big foundations in America decided to give mosquito nets. Uh, there was malaria outbreak in Tanzania. So they said, oh, you know, the Maasai's are getting malaria, so let's give them mosquito nets. Now the, <laughs> the Maasai's are nomads. And they ended up using the mosquito nets uh, for fishing. And the nets were so fine, they picked up the egg along with the fish. And so next year's fish crop was gone. And, you know, that's why the failure to imagine the last leads to a solution which has unintended consequences. Uh, okay, so I've been signaled. I'm sorry, there were some chits going around because we didn't know where we were going on time and whether you we were going to be allowed a tea break or not between this session and the next, but there will be a tea break. Uh, but uh, is that the last, is that the only question we have now? So in, if there's only one, we take it and then we'll wrap up, yeah, okay. Can you, uh, thank you. Thanks, Ruchira, I'm Indrajit. It doesn't look like I'm dead. Uh, thanks for your presentation and you really took up a lot of uh, really important issues. One thing that I have always thought and I keep on thinking is actually getting that most, the, like the last one, last girl, or getting it. It's, it's the difficulty as a programmer is always, like it is really scattered. You go to any village, you'll get a, or you go to any specific area, you get, get a few of those last girls. And as a, as a programming, it is always difficult to do a programming like that, and that's why most of the money when we start, like when HIV started, probably didn't start like a quantum distribution program, but uh, because in order to make it generalized, in order to make it more objective and getting those numbers, we go going there. But I really struggle to think of really how do we uh, make a programming for that last girl? How do I find them? And how can I manage a program which is so scattered and probably uh, work, working in the in that uh, in, in the most marginalised uh, views? I think uh, it is creating systems. You know, the first question that she asked me or mentioned that is the answer because once you have a system in place, that system has to be created to reach the last. So, you know, thinking about how can I get a government scheme to the doorstep of the last, and we were creating those systems. The pity is that we are thinking, oh, those systems were not good enough, let's dismantle it. So we don't even realize all the gains we have made in 60 years because we are not comparing ourselves to other countries which have stepped out of colonialism. You know, a lot of time I hear the flip remark, ki saad saal mein kuch nahi hua. To kya saad saal ke pehle sab kuch hua tha kya? You know, we are literally losing, uh, taking for granted what we have. And I think, uh, you know, the systems exist. We have to revitalize the systems and push them to reach the last. Because if there is a district health center, at least there will be somebody who will be thinking about the girl in the Moser Tola. So we have to think about it, that how do the systems think, and let's not get ourselves programmed with this new thinking of smart. Because you and I are the same generation where smart has been thrust down at us, and I worked in the UN for 15 years in Iran and um, Nepal and uh, US and uh, you know the same, and Thailand and the same thing you know we were pushed into thinking like that and then I began to realize the limitations of that because when you create a system which starts bottom up when you create the system from the bottom then what happens is that system will tackle everybody even the second last the third last but when you create top down it will stop them it doesn't reach the bottom the trickle down theory you know we know it's failed Is that a good note to go to tea on? Yeah. <laughs> so, but I think, uh, thank you, Ruchira. I think it was a, a great way to start the day. Uh, everybody has, uh, I think, slowly warmed up and are now, uh, we, we'll, we'll at least look at everything that happens, hopefully for the next couple of days through this prism. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, Sunita is making,
Thank you. Sure, we'll leave the stage quickly. So, thank you. And I think the tea break is what at the back of the room. Yeah. Oh, in the next room. Okay. Uh, and you want everybody back here by 10:45? Yes. All right. Thank you. 10:44. 10:44. So.